So it's concrete day, or at least that's what I was told. We'll see when everybody shows up. But first, I got to get this building unlocked so everybody can have access to the footer. So it's finally time for concrete. I feel like I've been waiting for this day for months, although it's just been a few weeks. It feels like it's taken forever to get to this point. Everybody showed up when they were supposed to, and everybody had done the jobs that they were supposed to, which was nice for a change. Now the lady that you see here owns this concrete pump and had been running a pump, she said, for about 30 years, which was pretty impressive. I'd never seen one of these in person. This one had a small four-cylinder gasoline engine. It was a pretty neat little design. I talked to, talked to her about the pump for quite some time. I was somewhat interested in it. Now, this is a two-inch line pump. They obviously make them much bigger than that. For this job, this was all that was needed. I had 10 yards of concrete in this truck. It was a grout mix that broke out at about 5,000 PSI, so I was told. Now we're gonna be pumping a heavier, a higher slump mix or a lower slump mix in the beginning so it stands up good in these steps she was priming the pump there and then they're going to wet the mix down to uh, fill the lower run So I can imagine that holding on to one of these surgeon lines from a concrete pump would get pretty tough and tiring by the end of the day. This being a two inch line, probably a little easier than holding on to the much bigger four inch line. Probably be a multiple man job on the larger lines, but this one guy that was running this line, he ran it the entire job. And then he had a helper just keeping it all you know, straightened out for him, helping him move it around a bit. And he did his best to try to keep concrete from getting in between the forms and the actual ground. Um, they're already in there tight enough and definitely didn't need to be concreted in. But, you know, you can just do the best you can do. This thing surging and spitting. Uh, so, yeah, most of it got inside the forms. That's, uh, that's all that matters. Uh, you did a good job. I wouldn't want to have to run one of these all day. So right at about this point in the job, I was somewhat concerned. You know, are, are my forms going to hold up? I was pretty confident that they would, but 
having never built forms before, you know, I didn't know. I wasn't for sure. And, you know, if they blow, then you've just got a mess of concrete everywhere and there's really nothing you can do about it. Because you work on concrete schedule and uh, it doesn't care if your forms blow out or not. It sets up one way or another. So, at this point, I was <laughs> a little nervous. But, you know, rightfully so, I guess. You're dealing with thousands of dollars in concrete and manpower and uh, you just hope that everything goes right. Start the bottom corner down there and come back here or what? Yeah, I don't care wherever you guys want to start. If you want to start right here, that's fine. I don't oh, we care. Can while we're here. You want the way back up there? Well, either way, we go, either way we go, I gotta drag that hose out. So about every four feet down this long run of trench there is a piece of vertical rebar stuck in the ground and cut off to a very specific height. Those are grade stakes is what they were called and that's the way that uh, this concrete crew felt comfortable getting this concrete to the proper height. Now I don't care much for that method simply because it can cause rusting issues, rebar in the ground, in, con in contact with the ground is uh, not the best idea. But that's the way they wanted to do it, and I wanted concrete in the ground, so I agreed to it. But I chose to pull it out, uh, or pull all those grade stakes out uh, after the job was finished. Luckily, these guys drilled down into the ground and just placed the rebar into a hole, uh, which meant that it pulled out very easily. So it wasn't a big deal. So it worked out pretty well for all of us, I guess. So I got my concrete from Herod Concrete and Stone. It's basically the same outfit that all my gravel came from and all their trucks are front load trucks. And with the chutes, all the chutes on, you can reach about halfway down the building. If a person would have wanted to wheelbarrow a bunch of concrete to the back and done it that way without a pump, it could have, it could have easily been done. But it was just easier for the cost of a pump to you know, just have it pumped back there with a hose. It's just the way to go, in my opinion. It made more sense, and in the long run, uh, it didn't cost me any more money to have it pumped than you know, what I would have had to pay labor for somebody to foot it back there, and it happened quicker. So, you know, it ended up working out. Pretty happy with the way everything came together.
so that's actually turned out pretty good. I'm actually pretty happy with the way that uh, everything worked out. The pump didn't die, so it worked the whole job. The mix was about right as far as it standing up in the, uh, in the steps here. The only thing that I failed to do was to mention that I wanted this vibrated, but it was too late. Once they showed up and the truck was here, uh, they didn't have you know, vibratory equipment with them. So I missed out on that, but that's my fault because I failed to mention it. But I don't think it's going to matter at all. Uh, that mix looked like it went in here really well. It was, it was like a grout mix, I think. Uh, I was told it busted out at about 5,000 PSI. So as big as this footer is, it's never going to have any problems that I can foresee. Um, and it looks all right. I'm getting a little dirt on it from my tarp blowing around. But you know, dirt knocked onto it, but once it's dry, that'll knock right off, and it won't make any difference at all, to be honest. So there we go. I'm going to let this set up just a little more, then I'm going to pull plastic over it and uh, wet it down a little bit, let it cure. So this is one of the handiest tools that I've ever bought, but I rarely use it, but when I do, you know, it saves me. It's just a vibr vibrating cutter, battery powered. I'm using it to cut this board here, because this is, I knew I'd have problems getting these forms out in this corner, and uh, I figured I would use this, and it's working. I'm just going to cut this board, and I can get down in there, cut it, and then I'll try to break it out. Hopefully it'll come out. Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh, there's another one. Two. See if we can find any more. Everywhere. In order to find them, you have to actually look for them. So I'm about to weld a very special piece, one that is very similar to one that I had done probably six months back. It's a 3D printed stainless steel piece of heat exchanger packing. I don't think there's really any other way on the planet to make this piece without 3D printing it. Um, all the little fins that run through the center that you've seen there, they're all hollow and they're all plumbed into the two little fittings that you see sticking off to the side of this thing. So I did one of these uh, probably I don't know, six months ago or so, and like I mentioned, the welding this 3D printed stainless steel is just like welding any other stainless steel. I couldn't tell the difference at all. And uh, you know, I'm just running one bead around here, just lightly, because these are just going to be right at or slightly above atmospheric pressure, so there's no chance of you know, this coming apart. Causing any issues, so no reason to overdo it. I'm welding on this large block of uh, aluminum to help wick some of the heat out of this thing so it doesn't warp or cause many issues. And uh, using my new speed glass uh, ventilated helmet that I really like. So the welder that I'm using is a Miller Dynasty 200, it's the DX. Really like that welder. I've had I've used it for years and I've never had the first trouble out of it at all. Uh, burn up quite a few uh, tick torches with it. Never once has the welder itself let me down. So what me and my son didn't do when we moved all these block out here is sort them by style. We just kind of stacked them all in one big pile, we figured we'd worry about it later. Well it now is later and what I need to do is of course sort them by style and by quantity that I need them and also I want to make sure that they're perfectly usable so anybody who lays these blocks can just pick it up 
and use it, they don't have to worry about chipping off the excess mortar. Because I would say that's probably the main gripe to uh, reuse and block is you know, they're just probably not good and clean. So I want to make sure they're good to go before uh, that time comes. Asking a block mason to use used block is like asking a carpenter to build you a room extension with old lumber with nails in it. Uh, you know, nobody's going to be excited to do that. So I'm just taking my time to make sure that the quantity of my blocks is correct, all of them are perfectly clean, and that, uh, you know, it's, it's not a hassle to use these used blocks. So I've got the large portion of my half blocks cut. One, one of these and one of those equaled one block. They're smooth on one side and then got a track on the other. I assume that's for windows is what I was told anyway. But these will be used on the long wall right at where it transitions from block to wood. So that'll be capped with wood for that transition so you won't see it at all. And these with the smooth face will be used anywhere uh, where you know it's visible or the block comes to a stop. But <laughs> for the uh, block mason that th built this building, ab accidentally used one of those in uh, the doorway uh, and filled it in. I'll show you. He made a mistake. So for simply cosmetic reasons, I'd say most people would prefer a smooth-faced block in a door opening or anywhere where the end of the block is exposed. But here's an outlier on this door opening where they probably just didn't have another half block and chose to use one with a slot in it. And all they did was fill it with mortar. I mean, really, it looks fine. I didn't even notice it until I started looking at the block work closer. But uh, there you go. There's an example of uh, the smooth-faced end and then the slotted end simply peeled with mortar. Either one would work, really. So here's what I think is an enclosure block, which means it's the last block that the guy set down in his row to make a full course. And he probably had some distance errors. You can see he chipped off all the ends. And maybe you can see it there if it's in frame. And he did it on this end as well. So he was having a little trouble getting a block to fit. So he just used his hammer and uh, chipped off the ends, slid it in there. I'm sure it worked just fine. But, you know, that just... Uh, an example of where he was making up some room, or making up for lost room. So there's several examples here of blocks that I don't want in my final stack, and that's blocks like this. Even though this block is usable, uh, it's not usable if you're going to fill the cells full of mortar. So this has to go be set out to the side, and you could chip that out if you wanted, but it's not worth it. So that's a that's a trash block almost. This block, perfectly fine, so I just run my hand over it, just making sure, you know, even though the corner on this one's a little chipped, you know, it, even if it was a little bigger chip than that, it, that won't make any difference. Uh, even new blocks have rougher corners, uh, most of them anyway. Their blocks are just so soft, they're easy to chip, but that won't hurt anything. So that's a good block. This is a block that I'll use, just making sure that there's no holes in it, no mortar that's going to hinder the building process and throw it in the stack and, you know, move on one at a time. Thank <laughs> you. 
So basically, all my blocks are clean and ready to use. I've got end blocks here. I've got spanner or stretcher blocks here. And then some half blocks here. And then I've still got a pile out behind the shop that need cleaned. Probably this big or maybe a little bigger. And a few blocks here. But other than that, plenty, plenty of blocks to get started. So that's nice. And there's no such thing as a free lunch, even though I reusing these blocks it was definitely a lot of work to get the mortar off of them and get them to where i can use them again so let's go up here let me show you the footer I'm excited about it well i have a feeling that after everything else is completely gone around here this will be sticking out of the ground and archaeologists will be trying to decipher the initials that me and my wife scribed on here there's enough between eight and ten yards of concrete in just the footer for this building that's pretty impressive and uh, I don't think it'll have any problems at all holding the weight that I'm going to be putting on it. Plus all the steel that's in this thing, it should be ridiculously strong. <laughs> overkill, for sure, but that's fine. Uh, if you're going to go overkill on something, it might as well be the footer of a building. So, I think it looks pretty good. I checked it with a laser. It's well within reason, as close as it needs to be, I assume. And I'm ready to start building on this thing. I did keep it covered for about three days and wet, and that's enough. I'm, it's time to move forward, and that's what I want to do. I've been waiting for this for quite some time, so I'm glad that it's done and behind me. That's for sure. So that's it. Appreciate all the support. Thanks to my viewers, patrons, subscribers. You know, this is this is where it's going. So that's it. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll get you a better look at it uh, next week when I have more time. So. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.